late afternoon ahead of us today because we are welcoming um, a very recent member of staff, um, Annika Falkert, who has um, had various positions in many universities and, and um, higher education institutions. She started her, her studies in Berlin at the Humboldt Universität Berlin in musicology and philosophy, um, gaining a, a Magister Artium there. Before coming to the UK, to Raw Holloway, um, to do a PhD thesis on British musical modernism defended against its devotees. She has studied at, uh, sorry, worked as a research assistant at University of Nottingham, a visiting lecturer at Raw Holloway, um, also at Leeds Trinity University and City Lit Univer in London, music appreciation there, before moving to University of Bristol to get a, a coveted postdoctoral Leverhulme Early Career Fellowship, and we know how difficult they are to get, on a, with a monograph project on Elizabeth Lutyens and Edward Clark. She was then um, appointed as a lecturer in musicology at Liverpool Hope University and joined us in September 2020. So I'm not sure whether, um, I, I know I know Anna, Anna Cope from Royal Music Association and other places, conferences, etc. But I don't think I've actually seen you in person since you started with us in, in, in the autumn. Um, just to say that Annika is an early career um, early career member of the, the Council of the RMA and recently launched a mentoring system, um, scheme, which is a very important initiative, um, thanks to, to Annika. Annika has a number of publications, um, many chapters and books and journal articles. For example, Lutyens in Liverpool, Always a European, about Edward Clark's musical work, um, and the latest is a microtonal restraint from the Journal of the Royal Musical Association. And today she's going to be talking to us about Elizabeth Lutyens, I believe. And so please welcome Annika. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, for the for the very, very kind introduction. I feel yeah, like I've like I've come a little way <laughs> when you when you put it like that. And I guess I have. Um, so yeah, it is um, as you can imagine an absolute pressure. Uh, sorry, pleasure and a bit of pressure there. It's, let's start with a Freudian slip to you know to begin with, and um, to be presenting here because of course this is the first time I realise that some of you actually get a glimpse of what it is that I do when I do uh, research. So um, yeah, no pressure. Um, but it is a pleasure to see all of you here and I'm very, very grateful um, that you've all come and I very much look forward to, to hear what you, what you will be asking or what you will be saying afterwards. Not least because what I'm presenting today is still work in progress. Um, so uh, it's it's for the book that I'm writing on Elizabeth Lutyens and Edward Clark. It'll probably feature as as one of the one of the chapters that is more focused on Elizabeth Lutyens and uh, her compositional strategies up to and including 1962, when Edward Clark, who was one of her, well, not just her husband but also her her partner, sometimes her collaborator, although they probably would have rejected that idea, um, but also what she always called her yardstick when Clark died in 1962. So this is one of the chapters um, that kind of focuses on, on this idea. I will start sharing my screen with you um, and have to apologize in advance if you hear banging. Um, there is apparently something interesting going on with a bathroom next door in the terrace next door. And um, I've already spoken to Tom before and unfortunately occasionally if there's a loud bang, you may be able to hear it. So apologies for that in advance. Um, hopefully you can now see my PowerPoint. Um, here we go. Okay, good. Uh, so let me just arrange everything so that I can actually see what I'm doing. Good, here we go. So um, Elizabeth Lutyens' Anxieties, I've christened this talk. Um, it's, it features in, in some of the theory and some of the um, works by Elizabeth Lutyens that I'm looking at in the book. But in this presentation, I um, want to uh, firstly extrapolate um, a notion or an idea of influence and musical influence, influence flowing from works or from composers to other composers and back, and particularly of anxiety of influence. 
and some of the challenges that this brings, especially for Elizabeth Latins. Um, I'll then provide a very brief overview of Latins' own background and aesthetics, uh, which shaped the role of influence in her work to a large degree. And finally, I'll show one example, one case study uh, of such anxiety of influence in action in her piece called Symphonies for Solo Piano, Wind, Harps and Percussion of 1961. So um, to start with anxiety of influence, modernist music, music, in the modernist age in the 20th century was intensely invested in questions of originality, of course, authenticity and anxiety um, over the dominance of, of dead composers' works over those of the living. And this is the advent of recording and broadcasting technology, of course, in the early 20th century, uh, which contributed to this, um, to this conversation, just as did the increased availability of scores of complete editions um, of composers and the canon formations that this brought. So many composers in the early 20th century to mid 20th century struggled with, on the one hand, the demands um, really in an industry whose audiences wanted to hear what they already thought they knew. And on the other hand, there were modernist ideals of originality and individual style, personality and authenticity to be negotiated, of course. Um, Joseph N. Strauss, um, his book, Remaking the Past, Musical Modernism and the Influence of the Tonal Tradition, locates a kind of nostalgic musical modernism between these extremes. In this study from 1990, Strauss argued that those composers we most associate with modernism um, and the birth of post tonal music were in fact constantly looking over their shoulder, as it were, developing ways to cope with, to relate to, and to build on um, seemingly ubiquitous tonal tradition. Uh, the book's case studies present music by Schoenberg, Bach, Weber, Bartok, and Stravinsky, so the usual suspects, if you like. Strauss analytically teases out what he calls eight revisionary ratios in the music of these composers, and you have them here on the slide. Moreover, Strauss claims that it's these strategies, um, I quote, more than any specific musical structure that define a 20th century common practice, end of quote. So these ratios describe specific intertextual relationships between what Strauss calls a precursor and a successor work. So an older tonal piece of music, say, by Wagner or Chopin or someone, and a modernist post-tonal piece, maybe Weber, maybe Stravinsky. So these ratios that Strauss calls up are motivization, generalization, marginalization, centralization, compression, fragmentation, neutralization, and symmetricization. To give you an example, centralization is a successor work building on a musical aspect, which in the precursor, specific precursor work, was audible or was kind of feasible and you could hear it, but was at the margins of kind of the, the structural central idea of the piece, and which is then taken and kind of centralized in the, in the successor work. In his book, Strauss uses the example of Stravinsky's Serenade in A from 1925 as a centralizing successor to Chopin's Ballad No. 2 as a precursor. So Strauss argues that Stravinsky's Serenade does not limit itself to centralizing aspects of Chopin's Ballad, but that this aspect, uh, these aspects that it centralizes are quite prominent in uh, Stravinsky, but not so much in the Chopin. Besides, both pieces really toying with relationships between F major and A minor. So for Strauss points, um, Strauss points to the ballads descending tetrachords, which is A, G, F, E, or F, E, D, C, which in the Chopin are present, but Strauss argues not terribly central. And then Strauss argues, and I quote, in the Serenade in A, so in the Stravinsky, these tetrachords in the set class of which they are members um, are centralized. They move from the periphery of the predecessor work to the structural core of its strong descendant, end quote. Strauss shows this then in how the outer voices of the serenade compose out, for example, the tetrachord of A, G, F, E as a whole. Strauss's revisionary ratios, and of course centralization is only one of these, um, and they're really for Strauss coping mechanisms in the face of a dominant tonal tradition, how these ratios were in their turn influenced by Harold Bloom's work in his seminal book, The Anxiety of Influence from 1973. So this idea of the anxiety of influence first came to life in literary criticism, and particularly the analysis of poetry that Harold Bloom is famous and indeed much criticized for. Now, Bloom had declared basically that strong poets develop their style in struggle and in conflict with older models, their precursors, who are also great poets. So it is a model very much inspired by 
we could say Oedipus as much as Hegel, really. The young poet, in a way, must, must shake off the overbearing influence of his precursors, figuratively, in a way, kill them off, so that poetry can reach a kind of higher stage in its evolution out of the synthesis of opposites, if you like. Bloom developed six such ratios to comprehend and trace the nature uh, of the struggles and defenses these poets fought with um, in their predecessors. And uh, these are Kinamen, poetic misprision, Tessera, completion and antithesis, Kenosis, repetition and discontinuity, demonization, the construction of a counter sublime, Ascesis, purgation and solipsism, and Apophrodes, the return of the dead. Bloom's universe of poetry is populated by what he called strong poets. So poets who needed to wrestle their precursors to the ground and using these six strategies or revisionary ratios in order to do so. Strauss indeed criticized this Bloomian idea of strength. As Strauss said, I quote, Bloom is interested not so much in beauty as in power, end quote. Other points of criticism of this Bloomian theory concern the, the gendering um, of the theoretical a network in which precursors and successors are almost exclusively men. Um, it is in its original form also strongly heteronormative, um, populated by, um, by, by, by strong kind of, most of them heterosexual men. And in Bloom's reading, for example, Oscar Wilde is mentioned right in the preface, but he is um, not strong enough in Bloom's reading to work as a successor and is embittered by this, according to Bloom. So you can see there is a lot of baggage that, that this theory really comes with and that Strauss tries to neutralize in a way when he kind of takes over um, the idea of an anxiety of influence, but then puts eight revisionary and much more technical ratios on things than Bloom six, really. Um, so in Joseph Strauss, but also in uh, music analysts and, and historians like Charles Rosen or Kevin Corson's applications in music analysis, um, we're confined to uh, composers like Brahms, Schoenberg, Stravinsky, um, and their colleagues, while people like, for example, Max Reger or Benjamin Britten are either dismissed or don't feature at all. Um, so there's much, much more to say here and much work in this regard, criticizing Bloom and also then those who work with it in music. Um, in music. Much work here has been done by uh, Lloyd Whitesell in an article entitled Men with a Past, Music and the Anxiety of Influence. Um, I have that on the bibliography slide, which I'm going to present you um, to, as we move towards the questions. But I want to come back to this original idea Bloom uh, called his anxiety of influence. And it is really an anxiety over the originality of composition, um, of, of poetry of composition, um, over how anything, over the question of how anything can be original when seemingly everything has been said already in some way. So we can only ever stand on the shoulders of giants, or like Brahms said here, giants march behind us. It's decidedly this theory about the spaces in between a precursor and a successor work. And as Corsin has pointed out in his application to Brahms and Chopin, it is about imagination. The imagination we need to hear the familiar in the new and vice versa. The imagination we apply when we write and interpret music and write about music. And needless to say, Bloom's revisionary ratios and um, Strauss's are indeed not a silver bullet. So neither can, be, can they be applied regardlessly to any and all composer, nor can they claim to cover every possible creative strategy that a poet or a composer might come up with and might use, of course. So that just as a very, very limited um, kind of criticism and, and summary of criticism and warning. Having said this, um, I need to mention yet another type of anxiety over kind of authorship or creativity before I come back to, to Elizabeth Lutyens. And that is the anxiety of authorship indeed. Uh, so where Bloom and his successors apply the anxiety of influence mostly to male poets and composers, this anxiety of authorships grew out of um, feminist literary criticism. It's rooted, if you like, more deeply, as it threatens not only originality of what is produced, but creativity itself. In questions about the lack of predecessors, the lack of discipleship, and thus questions of, of style. Um, let me just reference uh, one or two examples of the writings, um, who claimed that she, I quote, had no real precedent, whereas men have precedence for anything they want to be great artists, climbers of Everest, what have you, um, end quote. Lachians frequently made remarks um, such as this one, but they are usually balanced by her insistence that this lack of a precedence as a composer that she felt was not going to hold her back. So perhaps that it even gave her um, some kind of freedom that she might not have had had she been influenced strongly um, by, by previous composers. 
So in an interview with Marie Schaefer in 1963, for example, she maintained that, I quote, being a woman never enters into my conscious thought when I'm working. I write as a composer. That is all, end quote. It sounds a bit as if Latins felt that she was walking a fine line between uh, the fine line in terms of her style and originality. So as a female artist, as a woman, and of course she was confronted with this all the time in her work, she was in a way damned if she did, and damned if she didn't play the game of influence. Placing herself outside a school or tradition or influence meant isolation, especially as on her chosen path, that was that of a 12 tone composer in mid 20th century Britain. But placing herself within such a school would have increased the danger of being seen as derivative, she felt, as a minor composer who was just imitating the models um, or her influences. And we can find this, this type of anxiety, of course, um, mentioned over and over again. Um, so, for example, um, in Hélène Sisou's um, seminal essay, Le, the Laugh of the Medusa, uh, in which um, Sisou posits that a quote, woman must write woman and man, man. So only women can ever kind of create in a way a, a kind of line of influence or a line of precursors for, for women writing. Only women can write women and men should write men. Um, we can talk about this in a lot more depth, obviously, but this is one of the kind of connections where these things anchor. Slightly later, influential feminist milestone of literary criticism, Sandra Gilbert and Susan um, Guba's Mad Woman in the Attic, examined the context and history of female authorship in literature and emerged with the popular idea of literary paternity. That's the idea that female creativity was locked up in the attic, much like Mr. Rochester's first wife in Jane Eyre. And as if there were no precursors and thus no one to even wrestle with. So it's in a way it's the opposite of Bloom, where with, in Bloom, these... Um, Poets always wrestle with their precursors in this idea of the um, anxiety of authorship. There is no one to wrestle with. There's a kind of vacuum in a way. In musicology, this idea of the anxiety of authorship was then taken up by music historians such as Marsha Citron. Which brings me finally after a whistle stop tour through um, all of this really to uh, Latians herself. Uh, about. In Latins' career, the decisive anxiety is that of influence, not of authorship, I would argue. That is remarkable um, because it rejects the implicit male-female divide of anxieties that we find in much of the literature. But I think it also allows us to analyze Latins' music as an essential participant in modernist traditions. If we accept with Strauss that this struggle with a precursor um, of sorts is something that unites this larger group of composers, that it kind of constitutes something like a common practice um, common practice characteristic in a way. So taking one step back, however, the origins of Latins' anxiety of influence, influence were biographical and they were twofold. So let me elaborate this a little bit. Uh, the first one was Latins' family background, I would argue. Latins was the daughter of the architect, so Edwin Latins, um, so an architect, and uh, she was also the daughter of uh, Lady Emily Lytton, a writer. So as such, the arts, especially writing and uh, visual arts, were omnipresent in Latins' childhood and youth. And she once said that, quote, with my decision to become a composer, I became involved in something the family neither knew nor cared for, so that no one could spoil it for me, end quote. So even if we take this with a pinch of salt, um, I think it reveals an early awareness of a potentially stifling influence of family precursors in a way. Music, Latins felt, was the one art that allowed her to compete in a way. Um, so coincidentally, it was also the art um, music of her beloved aunt Constance Lytton, who had been a pupil of Clara Schumann and a suffragette who fought alongside Emmeline Pankhurst and actually gone to hunger strike um, in Holloway prison. So Elizabeth Latins wanted to prove that she had what it took, not just to compose, but to be a professional composer. So someone who could who could sustain creativity, who could sustain professional um, composition over the course of an entire career, and who could earn money from doing so. So she studied music, um, first um, for a short spell at the Paris École Normale, and then privately with John Foulds, and then more formally at the Royal College of Music. And her subjects here were viola, and then finally also composition with Harold Duck. She emerged with a solid training, and with a vivid interest in early music, especially music by Frescobaldi, Purcell, Tallis, and other composers um, of that time. And there was a, she felt that here in, in these composers was a, was a benign and a meaningful influence that felt fresh for her and whose representatives were clearly far enough removed from her not to be a threat in that sense. <laughs> 
Latin's first compositions after the Royal College um, were contrapuntal, they were um, atonal, and Latin's claimed that the serialism she adopted in 1939 stemmed indeed from her studies of these composers, such as Purcell and Frescobaldi in particular, and not from Schoenberg and his disciples of the Second Viennese School. And this brings me to anxious influence number two, and this is a little more complex. In 1938, Elizabeth Latins met and with Ed Clark. Clark from Newcastle was a conductor and had been working for the BBC Music Department and the International Society for Contemporary Music. He'd also been Schoenberg's first English pupil just before the First World War. In fact, Clark got caught up in, in the First World War. He didn't make it back to England and was detained actually as a Civil, civil prisoner of war pretty much before he could get back to England and spend the entire duration of the First World War um, in a camp in Berlin, Rulim, um, just south of Berlin, um, detained there. So um, Clark studied with Schoenberg um, before the First World War, and that is the crux of the matter, or was the crux of the matter for Latins. Because Clark, of course, through this discipleship with Schoenberg, established something like a direct link for Latins with Schoenberg, and by proxy with Webern and Berg as well. And Clark was friends with Weber and Berg and Schoenberg indeed, and there are numbers of letters and postcards that they kept sending each other, and he invited them over a lot when he was working for the BBC. Consequently, the set of questions that seemed the most pressing for Latian's scholarship have been along the lines of whether Latians learned her serialism or her 12-tone technique from Schoenberg through Clark, in a way, or the question whether there was influence of Schoenberg over Latians or whether one of Britain's earliest, earliest serial composers, Latians, really belongs to the Viennese, uh, second Viennese school, if we think about it that way. And was Latians wrestling perhaps with Schoenberg back or Weber as influences? Now, faced with these questions, most scholars of, of Latians have tried to find evidence for or against Latians being involved through Clark with the second Viennese school. This is complicated by the fact that we don't actually know what Clark studied with Schoenberg, um, whether he really studied composition. He was a conductor himself and never composed, as far as I'm aware. And of course, this was before the First World War. So this was before Schoenberg himself turned um, to, to 12th tone music. But we also know that Schoenberg and Clark were in touch. And we also know that Clark owned a lot of scores um, by Schoenberg, Berg and Webern that he had in his flat. Um, so um, Latians easily could have picked up on these things or studied scores, perhaps when she popped round to Clark's flat, um, which was in um, Fitzrovia, uh, when she came over from Bloomsbury, where she was living at the time for a glass of Chateau Neuf du Pape, which was their favorite wine. So it is um, it is difficult to just decide, um, and even if we had a time machine, we might never know, um, whether she actually kind of had a look at Weber scores or whether she didn't. Latians herself was always adamant that her 12 tone technique had been developed independently of Schoenbeck and his scores and his, his disciples and his kind of second Viennese school. She rejected influence from the second Viennese school over her work. For example, she claimed once that um, scores by Weben only became available in Britain in 1942, while her first serial composition was from 1939. So these are the kind of arguments that we that we get from her a lot. But of course, we know that Clark owned these scores, you know. Um, we also know that even if there were no textbooks, um, there was, of course, talk and there were reviews and you wouldn't necessarily need a score by Weben in order to be able to um, find out something um, about serialism or 12 tone music. So there is a quite an inconclusive situation here that we might argue has held up part of Latin scholarship because we keep um, running up against this wall of where did she get it from? Did she really invent it herself, like she claims, or did it come through Clark um, from the second Viennese school? So rather than joining the hunt, really, uh, for some form of biographical evidence, um, whether she knew or did not know or was influenced or was not influenced by these composers, I have sought to explain a little bit where Latins' insistence of independence came from and how it may have manifested itself in her 12 tone composition after 1939 and her, in her aesthetics as a modernist composer. So my aim is not to prove that she hushed up her influence uh, or really that she, there was no influence at all, but to see what ideals of composition, uh, what strategies really are at work here and how she builds a defense um, as a modernist composer against this anxiety of influence that I think we I've, that we feel very, 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 very kind of clearly um, in all her writings and in her work. And this is something that's been done for modernist composers or for Brahms. Um, but to, in my knowledge, not for women composers at all. 
So for Latians, the turn to 12 tone music was the logical extension in a way um, of her earlier turn to music in the first place. So in both cases, she thought that she had found something that was her own only really, something that her family and in the case of 12 tone uh, music, her fellow British composers at the time could not claim to share really. Her understanding of influential precursor works was partly colored by her initial position of being an outsider to the European avant-garde. Before she met Clark, this avant-garde had presented itself as quite hermetic to her. It was continental, European or international uh, male composers writing technically advanced music. And with Clark entering her life, Clark was very active at the International Society for Contemporary Music. And with her access to his library and her first visits to festivals of the International Society for Contemporary Music, this hermetic tradition in a way began to open up and began to become her own. And we may assume that she therefore started to wrestle with it, just as composers wrestle with precursors or with contemporaries. Clark, and through him, Webern and Schoenberg in particular, represented such a precursor of influence and style. However, much like a collaborator, Clark, of course, was also physically there, actually. It was a lot of the time he was in the room when Latins was working or when Latins was talking about music. He was physically by her side, sometimes on the conductor's podium, in the audience, or talking to her about the music of, of, his, of his friends, Stravinsky, Schoenberg, Berg, Weben, mentioning a text or a book or a piece of interest that he dug up in his study, and um, which was famously full of um, the most... Um, uh, the most surprising um, artifacts of, 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 of music that he, that he housed in flat, flat in, in, in um, Fitzroy Street in London. And Lat Latians always highlighted Clark's roles and at the same time sought to provide herself really with, a, with her own narrative of struggle and victory over influence from an early age. She used metaphors a lot of the time to characterize her outsider existence. That, for example, as a British 12 time composer, she felt like a communist before the Committee for Un American Activities. That's what she once wrote in her autobiography. Or the metaphor of the goldfish bowl, which is the title of her autobiography, representing um, perhaps a, a kind of representing stifling environments uh, kind of little little bowls of, um, of specific kind of types of music uh, that she that she was working in and that she didn't quite feel at home in. Um, her insistent narrative of being isolated from peers and contemporary European trends could be read more generally as an overarching type of ascesis, perhaps, this solipsism um, and isolation that Latin sought to evoke in order to describe her situation within the goldfish bowl of British contemporary music and to escape the criticism of influence as a weakness, really. Bloom's description of this state is, I quote, a movement of self-purgation which intends the attainment of a state of solitude. The later poet, or in this case, we could say Latin's the later composer, does not undergo a revisionary movement, sorry, does not undergo a revisionary movement of emptying, but of curtailing. He yields up part of his own human and imaginative endowment so as to separate himself from others, including the precursor. A further indicator of ascesis, a way of dealing with this, um, is Latin's antagonism to music analytical descriptions of her work. In a program note, she once dismissed analytical approaches. Um, quote here, um, who in hell cares, she said, whether a series goes up or down, whether a retrograde version is used or a numerical rhythmic pattern adopted. This is workshop stuff anyhow, and in no way necessarily contributes to the quality of the music or the musical experience. And then she kind of took it back and said, this does not mean that music is unexplainable or incapable of analysis, end quote. So despite her own resistance to laying a path for analytic insights into her music, um, I think it pays off to uh, look in some detail at some of her strategies and her intertextuality. By doing so, I think we can locate Latins as a composer among colleagues and contemporaries more than has been done until now for her, her music, and acknowledging and highlighting influences not um, as weaknesses but as strengths. So the idea behind this argument is that to incorporate influence is a strength in a composer's work, not a weakness. And this comes directly also from Bloom and from Strauss, which called this the misreading of precursors. And they claimed that misreading or misprision can provide the most interesting and perhaps the most satisfying interpretations of the spaces between successor and precursor works. So um, it's probably time to listen to some music because <laughs> I've been talking for quite a while here now. So I would like to play you um, the beginning of uh, her work Symphonies for Solo Piano, Wind, Harps and Percussion from 1961, um, Latin's piece 
The recording is from 1963, Katharina Volpe on the piano and um, the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Uh, this is a recording which I digitized from tape um, in the University of York Music Press archives. So the quality is not ideal, just simply becomes, because it comes directly from a tape. So I hope you'll be able to hear this. I'm just gonna turn my sound up um, and here we go. Right, so I've faded it out here. Apologies, the, I realise the, the quality isn't great there. And this is the only recording that I'm aware of um, that I could get a hold of that exists. Um, let's see. Um, here we go. So um, Symphonies was Lutyens's first commission for the BBC Proms. She had had pieces performed at the Proms before, but this was her first commission. Um, and this, of course, is one year after uh, William Block became the BBC music controller, who uh, was a friend of Lutyens's and... and was was a great in a way support and and patron of her music really um so this is um her first proms commission and is also one of her most intricate compositions i would say it's a complete horizontal palindrome the piece spread across eight sections um so this means that the entire pitch sections one and eight two and seven three and six and four and five are palindromic so sections four and five together forming the center of the piece so this is between sections four and five is where the piece basically, um, where, the, where the axis for the, for the mirroring um, sits. According to Latin's own program note, the piece concerns itself with echo or with mirroring, inspired by partly the notorious acoustics of the Royal, Royal Albert Hall in which it was premiered. Um, but slightly later, Latin's claimed in an interview uh, that the piece had been inspired by a palindromic pattern on a ceramic lid made by the potter Bernard Leach. You can see one of his, um, of his um, ceramics here. And she had seen a documentary on Bernard Leach in a TV program. It's quite common with Latin's that she claimed to have been inspired by the things she saw on TV or read in a book. Um, according to, um, so, sorry, this uh, reflection of, of mirroring of, of sound and of echo are also represented through the ensemble seating arrangement. So obviously there is the, the fact of the palindrome, but there is also the seating arrangement. So that we have four similar groups of six wind brass combinations and percussion, which are arranged on the stage like a fan and the piano, harps, timpani and one remaining percussion player are spread amongst these sections. A precursor of this idea, albeit similar, of course, is Bartok's music for strings, percussion, and celeste. Latins, but Latins never said this. Um, and uh, when in the interview she was challenged on a uh, quote, the real purpose of such trendy but perhaps superficial arrangements by the interviewer, she replied with reference to Stravinsky, quoting Stravinsky, uh, who, according to Latins, had claimed that the traditional orchestra, I quote, was anachronistic and of use only to anachronistic composers. Thank <laughs> you. 
So um, for Lutyens, um, the reference to Stravinsky is, is quite typical. Uh, she often quoted Stravinsky or other composer friends when she wanted to defend her ideas um, in such interviews or uh, defend ideas that, um, that seemed untraditional or non-traditional or, or strange to her interviews. But in the case of symphonies, um, I think it tells a longer story. In the title, of course, and in the instrumentation of this piece, Stravinsky is the obvious, but as usual with Latin's unnamed influence. Um, Stravinsky has, had written his symphonies for wind instruments in the 1920s, of course, and both Stravinsky's and Latin's symphonies feature a 24-piece woodwind and brass ensemble, whose lineup is also quite similar. Uh, Latins had known Stravinsky personally since 1954, and uh, they had been introduced by Edward Clark at a BBC rehearsal in London. Coincidentally, this was seven years after Stravinsky's revision of symphonies for wind instruments and seven years before her composition of symphonies. So in a way, there is another nice but probably coincidental symmetry in here. Latins and Stravinsky did occasionally correspond. Um, there are letters uh, written from Latins to Sri Basel um, and the Paul Zaha Foundation. But um, as far as I'm aware, Latins did not mention this particular piece to Stravinsky, which of course is surprising seeing that the title is, is so Stravinsky in a way. Nor does she seem to have sent a score to Stravinsky, which she would occasionally do with other pieces that she sent in the score and said, look, this is a homage to you and I'm, you know, I'm sending you the score, what do you think? So on the surface, this looks like Latins seeking to retain originality by denial of influence, perhaps, or by creating the illusion of a curtailing of um, external precursors in a way kind of, you know, again, we could read this as Bloom's Askeses. But the actual music of uh, symphonies, however, has probably one of the densest levels of intertextuality and influence in her music up to that point, at least, with references particularly to Weber and Bartok, and more so um, than to Stravinsky. The piece builds on a 12-tone aggregate and makes use of partitioning, of mirroring, dense chromatic chords and road transformations, while it also explores the timbres of her stringless orchestra. So um, the piece's surrealism is quite reminiscent of, of Weber and Bag, I would argue, much more than a lot of her other 12-tone um, rows actually are. But in a more, in a slightly hidden way, really, than the obvious allusions to Stravinsky in the title would lead us to assume. So the row has a symmetry, uh, as you can see, of interval classes at its core, and it encompasses all interval classes, actually, up to and including the tritone. Features that are reminiscent of Weber and Rose, so not of a specific one, perhaps. The initial interval classes of Latins' row are also identical to those uh, to the row of the third movement of Berg's lyric suite. Um, so if Latins' row is partitioned into four trichords, as I have indicated here, um, then all four trichords spell out the type of chord that Latins uses very, very frequently in symphonies. The so major seventh with a minor or major third um, from the higher end down. So the, in symphonies, the variance, the kind of yeah, the occurrence is really of this, what I've called an, an ur trichord really for her, are nearly ubiquitous, so they, they appear all the time. Symphonies um, begins with tam-tam blows, um, which are rising in pitch and dynamics, you can see that here, and with a powerfully accented and dissonant statement in the solo piano encoding, including one of these ur trichords. The scene is thus set um, with a sforzato on the last pitch of this prime row, um, D sharp. Latkins follows this up with alternating statements of inversion and prime transpositions. The structure here occasionally threatened to turn just the, the, the number of chords that she uses rather than um, kind of, yeah, so the, the chords, the kind of the chords in the serial piece threaten sometimes really to turn my construction of the matrix that you saw on the previous slides into, into something like an advanced game of Sudoku really, but um, the 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 play with symmetry and extreme range and uh, and klangfarb melody that we see later in the piece is is quite the, is quite Weber in a way. Um, but while Weber's palindromes and symmetries usually play out on a small scale, Latins focuses the palindromic construction by making the entire piece a horizontal palindrome of pitch, and to a degree instrumentation and rhythm as well as tempo. So speaking with Strauss. Um, she maximizes Weber's palindromic techniques, thus creatively misreading Weber as a precursor, if we, if we argue with Strauss. Where this touches on the structure and the tempi of the piece, um, that since it's perhaps more in line with Bartok's thinking, again, maximizing it to a degree, the five movements of Bartok's four string quartet, for example, form an arch or a bridge structure 
in which the movements one and five on the one hand and two and four on the other are related thematically and in character. Um, another example is Stravinsky's ballet, um, Agon, um, which begins and ends for dancers and the same music, albeit it's not palindromic as such. But in Lottins' eight section structure, the tempi um, of sections one and eight, two and seven, three and six respectively are identical, while the midpoint sections four and five share the fastest tempo, creating a similar arch thereby, you can see that here. But additionally, additionally, of course, these section couples, really, one and eight, two and seven, three and six, and four and five are identical in their pitch content, of course, because it is a complete um, horizontal palindrome. And this horizontal palindrome by Latins lives within this arched structure in the pitch organization and here in the order of the rows and collections whose individual statements are mirrored directly back from the end of the piece. To add to the rigor displayed here, Latins avoids retrograde transformations up to the midpoint and then deploys them heavily from the midpoint onwards to the end, providing what is in fact one of her most consistent serial overall structures to date. In this, um, there is more hidden Weber um, beneath this piece than in most other Latin's compositions. And of course, she never said anything about this. The idea of maximization of echo and of mirroring also influences the instrumentation of the piece. However, in these parameters, this idea is much freer executed and we might speculate whether this therefore kind of takes back or restrains this Verbanian, in, Verbanian, <laughs> Verbanian sorry, influence to a degree. Um, and especially the tam-tam stands out um, as an instrument as the most prominent announcer of these structural key points. So the instrument, the tam-tam opens and closes the piece, but it also signals the midpoint of the palindrome in bars 182 to 183 that you can see here with a sustained fortissimo. You can see here easily where the palindrome basically flips over into the second half on this with colors. So you can see that although these things may not look very, very similar on a, on a first glance, they're the same pitch content where it flips over pretty much. But there is um, no rigorous, no such rigorous crossing of instrumentation and um, orchestration in Latinus's piece. And rhythmically, a similarly free mirroring happens throughout the piece. Durations of rows and their retrogrades are frequently similar in relation to each other, but rarely identical. The frequent alterations of meter additionally prevent an alter rigorous approach here. One of the most striking examples of, of difference where the pitch class content is similar um, or is, is identical, but everything else is quite different um, is, is here in the mirroring of this. Um, it's a small three note motive, which really, really stands out in bar 330. It appears shortly before the end of the piece. Um, you see on the right side, where you can see B flat, B natural, and then G sharp. And again, there are the pitches that together define one of these ur tricords. And indeed, the first time in the mirroring in bar 10, where they appeared for the first time, they actually were such a chord, of course, spread through um, a much more extreme register. And apologies, um, I just spotted before we started this that I actually have a typo in there. Um, so it's, <laughs> it is um, G sharp, uh, B natural and B flat there. Um, so uh, it's a mean bit about palindromes, everybody can check and whether you've actually made a mistake. <laughs> Apologies for that. So, um, but with regards to the richness of palindromic and symmetrical influences and their control through um, free aspects, symphonies I think can claim pride of place in Latins' catalogue. Um, but besides the maximalization of Weber and pitch content and the curtailing, the ascesis of influence in her surrounding statements, there is perhaps another new revisionary ratio at work here, which adds to Strauss's list, if you like. And that's a kind of switch, or as I would call it somewhat controversially in German, a Verwechslung, a deliberate confusion by Latians over whose influence drives this piece. With a hint to Stravinsky in the title, the instrumentation and in her interview, Latians laid somewhat of a misleading trace of breadcrumbs for her audience and critics really. So while the title of Latins' symphonies announced and awakened expectations of neoclassical Stravinsky, the real influence between the lines were Webern and to a lesser degree Berg and, and Bartok. And this gave Latins an opportunity to combine, to maximize and restrain a whole field of influences of precursors here. She offered a challenge to Edward Clarks and her own musical heritage of these very, very contemporary precursors, as she wrestled not with one, but with aspects of several precursor works. And of course, she laid another breadcrumb trail herself by all the allusions to mirroring and to echo 
itself. Um, the guessing game, however, here was whose reflection, whose echo, whose mirroring we really hear in the piece. As an aside, I think um, it's also impossible to say that another reason behind this trail of Stravinsky and breadcrumbs may have been um, comparatively simple. Um, and we have to remember, of course, this was a proms commission. Um, and for a proms commission, referencing Stravinsky in the title would have made much more sense at the time than referencing Webern. Um, the proms were, were doused in Stravinsky at the time um, under Glock. So, for example, um, the Rite of Spring, if you check, just check the digital proms archive, the Rite of Spring was performed in almost every single prom season between 1960 and 69. Um, if you look for Webern in that time, unsurprisingly, of course, there's very, very little. So Latins was, in a way, there was certainly an element of, of kind of making that clear as well. But the concept of echo drawn out in the seating arrangements, in the pitch organization, and in the structure harnessed, I think, the full force of Latins and Clark's shared aesthetics here, really. And as such, it seems almost, almost prophetically that symphonies was the largest as a, the last large scale work of Latins is that she experienced in concert in the Royal Albert Hall together with Clark by her side. Um, in April 1962, Clark died. And for Latins, that mean, mean, meant really that, that an era ended. <clears throat> to conclude then, um, in the goldfish bowl of music in her time, Latins became I think a more skillful, a highly intelligent and eclectic composer, more so than she or her reception could or wanted to acknowledge. Her arrival at this position was endangered by more than one factor. She felt it necessary to fend off the different expectations that she had to contend with as a female composer. And she may have felt that as a female composer, whether identifying as such or not, the acknowledgement of influence carried a higher risk of being perceived as, as a weakness, as lack of originality and dependence. It was partly because of the conditions under which Lottins was able to conduct her studies that she could not lay claim to official discipleship and membership of the European avant-garde. So unlike the Schoenberg pupil Clark, for example, Lottins just simply had no such pedigree. For a British composer, and of course that's who she was as well, influence was sensitive in another sense of the, of the word perhaps. One of the highest values of earlier 20th century British criticism is tunefulness and and some forms of the anti-intellectualism that Sarah Collins referred to in our seminar a little while ago. Uh, they had representatives, of course, and, and schools and, and lines, lineages, really, of, of their own, and Latins, is, Latins was not a part of these either. So, for example, there were several um, other female composer, composer students while Latins was studying at the Royal College of Music. Um, Elizabeth McConkey, um, Imogen Holst, Dorothy Gow, uh, and they studied with Vaughan Williams, uh, for example, Latins was the only one who studied with Harold, Harold Duck. Um, and in later, in later life, Latins was always very grateful and, and was, was good friends with Harold Duck, as far as I'm aware. Um, but there is sometimes a bit of a sense that she, that she resented not having been in this, in this group of the Vaughan Williams students um, at the Royal College of Music. So for her as a British composer, that may have had, uh, may have had a bearing as well. Um, so drawing on influences as far reaching as, as hers, especially in this piece, was, was not easy to achieve. And that she decided to take this path, I think puts her, despite her own protestations, and that's the important thing here, because of course she never acknowledged any of this, firmly in, in one category with the very precursors that she wrestled with, um, just as they wrestled with their own precursors really. And I think for me, this is a chance to, to break open perhaps, or to open up um, Latin scholarship and thus perhaps even kind of wider scholarship on, on female composers, which still very often sees them or researches them or reflects on them in, in, in isolation or in, or in connection with other female composers of the time, but not so much within these broader fields, whether that is because we worry that by drawing these comparisons too closely, we might end up admitting that the female composers lose out or something is, is, an, is a completely different question. And I don't want to don't want to you know get into any kind of um, any kind of temptation of answering this. But um, for Latians, I felt that it is the time to maybe um, draw these draw these kind of allusions, uh, kind of bring bring these fields of influence together and and see what happens. And I think for symphonies, it's certainly shown that rather than falling apart, if anything, it makes the piece stand out and kind of belong uh, more than more than it may do if we look at it in, in complete isolation. Thank you very much.
Um, I, I've seen that there are some things that popped up in the chat as I was talking, but I took the liberty of just not looking at them yet. So um, we'll we'll see we'll see where we go with this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Annika. Great, we can see everyone again. Thank you. Um, fantastic, really, really um, fascinating talk, and 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 looking at some of the the issues around um, studying this this composer. Um, we've got had a number of things in in this uh, in the chat, but I don't think it's asking you questions yet. However, I'm going to give people a minute or two to um, to think of their questions. I'm sure there'll be plenty. We have some um, many people in this room who may well have interesting perspectives, either on the the the, the discussions you've been um, raising around influence and and where we might place. Um, somebody such as Lutchens and the, and the, in the, the sort of gaps when there aren't so many predecessors um, and also some of the more sort of technical and analytical issues that you have have raised. I want to start with, um, it sounds like a, 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 an interview or something, but I would start with a, a very open question. As a, as a, a scholar initially working in, in, in Berlin, what drew you to British musical modernism and Lutchens in particular? Oh, yeah, don't get me started. So, um, yeah, I, sometimes these things are quite random. Um, I became aware of Latins when I was uh, working as an intern at Bavarian Radio, actually, and, and they had put me in touch with a German uh, project at the University of Hamburg, um, Hamburg Conservatory, really, who were putting together an online dictionary of um, female musicians. And they just, because I was a beginner, they gave me a list and said, okay, look, we need articles on these five composers. Who can you work on? And Latians was among them. I had no clue who she was. I was, you know, studying for my, for my degree then. I didn't even know how to pronounce the name. So I thought, hey, great. But, you know, she seems to be British. So um, I come from a very, very Anglophile family. Hello, mum and dad at home. So um, they're watching on YouTube, I think. <laughs> so, you know, I thought I, you know, I thought I, I kind of I, I'd go for this. Um, but then my, well, my my MA magistra dissertation was then on, on Vaughan Williams's Fourth Symphony. So that's how I started. Of course, that always at the time in the, in the 30s, uh, people were were discussing that wildly over, you know, if it was ultra modern or where it came from, if it was, you know, Beethoven or whether it was Schoenberg on Mad, um, and that that interested me. I, I knew Vaughan Williams from um, from from concerts, rare concerts in Berlin. Um, it's not that Vaughan Williams gets performed a lot in in or got performed a lot in in Germany at the time, as far as I'm aware. Um, but I decided to, to settle on the Fourth Symphony just because of the the debates around it at the time, and that kind of these two things then kind of the fourth symphony by von williams and, and latians later on of course spanned open a an entire field that i became interested in and then i moved to london to do my phd because it became clear quite quickly that i needed to be um in britain in order to uh, to do this work that i wanted to do because the archives were there um and and kind of the, the the scholarship was 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 there. So that's that's basically how that happened. <laughs> and it, it really happened is is the word here. <laughs> and you stayed, which is great for us. So, who would like to ask the first question? Jeff, true to form. Jeff is a, is famous for us always asking the first question or when he can get in first. So over to Jeff. I do wait to see if anybody else wants to go in first. <laughs> Thank you very much, Annika. I'm, I'm fascinated. Um, I, I have to confess, I probably am more familiar with the work of Edwin Lutyens than I am with that of his daughter. Um, and I'm sort of wondering whether there might be parallels here, that Edwin Lutyens is one of those British architects who straddled the 19th and 20th centuries, who inherited a very conservative architectural tradition. I mean, this yeah. was the age of the, the tail end of the Gothic revival. And they, they, they sought ways of synthesizing this very traditional approach with more modernist ideas that were coming to the fore, things like the the Art of Vaughan movement. One thinks of architects like Caroe or Wood, for example. Um, and I wonder whether this kind of 
tension between modernism and tradition is something that sort of feeds into his daughter's approach, or indeed that of a number of her contemporaries who were very conscious of being part of a, a conservative British musical tradition, and yet at the same time were trying to find ways of reconciling that with more modernist ideas coming from outside the UK. Mm. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. Um, I mean, see, I'm, I'm, yeah, not, not so firm with when, with my knowledge of architecture. I have to admit, but of course, Lutyens, Edwin Lutyens, as the, as the person who um, designed, I think England's England's latest built castle um, in the early twenty. Castle, Dro Castle Drogo in, in Drogo, exactly, and Lindisfarne um, up north, um, but then also, of course, the entire government district of New Delhi. So there was, of course, a, a mixture of all, all kinds of things going on. I think he designed the headquarters of the Theosophical Society in London as well, didn't he? Mm, uh, yeah. Um, it's, a very, so, it's a very fine form of bank in Manchester, in yes. King Street, which is ah, yeah. great options. Yeah. Um, so, yes, indeed. Um, Edwin Lutyens, you know, without being a scholar of architecture, I would definitely say, yes, there is this element of, of old and new and 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 combining, reconciling perhaps even these two. I think that from reading about Lutyens, the way she describes what she's doing, she wanted to break free, I think. Um, that there is more of a sense of being a rebel um, in that, in, in, in her work and in her, where she, where she went and, and how, she, how she went about composing, but also how she went about studying. Um, then, I see perhaps in, in Edwin Lutyens's approach. Um, evidence I would I would cite is that, yeah, she of course she did study at the Royal College of Music. Yes, absolutely. Um, but her first subject really was viola, among other reasons, because people like Vaughan Williams, again, there's a bit of these legends which are hard to kind of find evidence for, but you know, the legend has it that Vaughan Williams didn't think she had the talent uh, and needed to become a composer. And she seemed, Lutyens seemed to strive on opposition. Um, so whenever someone said something like that to her, she was like, okay, now I really do want to become a composer. And she later on taught, always taught her pupils only become a composer if you cannot imagine living your life any other way, because it is going to be extremely hard. That's um, what Robert Saxton told me once when I interviewed him about, um, about Liz Lutyens, and he was, was very vocal about her. Of course, most people who speak to her Lutyens are very, very vocal about what a fascinating personality she was. Um, so, you know, from, from her own, uh, from her own, Basically, narrative of herself. Um, I think there really was more of a, a rebel identity in her than perhaps in her father. Although, of course, she she loved her father very, very dearly. Um, and in her autobiography, where she describes her, her youth and childhood, talks about him a lot. Obviously, he wasn't he was an absent father a lot of the time. Um, because he was away designing New Delhi, for example, for years at a time. Um, and Latin spent a lot of her childhood uh, traveling with her mother, actually, who was very active in the Theosophical Society at that time, and great friends with um, Annie Bazant uh, and learning from Krishnamurti. So she was very, very um, involved and, and steeped really in, in these Theosophical traditions and then rejected all of that. Um, because it's she she realized that it didn't it didn't work for her and it, it actually did her harm she she once claimed led to a nervous breakdown and then she went to Paris to study composition she didn't try to study composition in London first she went to Paris lived with a composer there it was a, um, a pupil and a friend of Nadia Boulanger's Ma, um, Marcel de Manziali um, and went with her to the Ecole Normale then she studied with John Foles who was always a bit of a rebel himself privately and then kind of started, only then did she go to the Royal College of Music. And as soon as she was out of there, um, she started becoming interested in um, the, the BBC Music Department and the, the kind of modernist things that Edward, Edward Clark was doing at the time. Um, and then really quickly, the ISDM as well. Uh, and one of the highlights of her life before the outbreak of the Second World War was a trip in 1939 to Warsaw. Um, where the um, festival, that festival of that year of the International Society for Contemporary Music work was being held and to hear the music that was being performed there. So in a way, you know, she she couldn't get away fast enough from, from those, you know, conservative pockets um, of British music in a way. But of course, how a composer um, 
describes or um, so reinvents um, themselves is, is is one part. Of course, what what we may hear um, or, or see in their music, of course, may not necessarily always correspond. And of course, I have to say this now because, of course, this reading that I've done on symphonies partly um, does does work that is related to kind of you know asking again, you know, so knowing what the composer said about it and then asking again, um, you know, is there perhaps another um, another way in? Is there perhaps another approach? You know, what what, what else is there beside the things that she said? Because there is often a lot of things that she didn't say. <laughs> Thank you. You know, she did visit the college in the 1970s. So ah. we must have performed some of her music. Oh, well, there we are then. Um, yeah, I know that she was, um, she taught at Dartington as well, I think twice or three times, two or, two or three years. Um, and then of course she had a, I think she has a visiting professorship or something like that at, at the University of York as well. Um, where I think she was she was very influential on, on some of the some of the people who um, who were studying there at the time. I see Jane um, smile. <laughs> um, but um, Lutyens' executor, Glyn, Glyn Perrin, met Lutyens there at York um, at that spell. So Lutyens, you know, what, I think once she had um, a certain level of fame, or, or we might even call it notoriety, um, she did actually um, travel around and was invited as a teacher and uh, to, to universities. Um, and she even... might well have come to the college through mm -hmm. John Manjewell, of course, through the BBC connection. Yes, I don't actually know that, but it's obviously yeah, it's quite possible. Um, I mean, Latin's in the BBC, that's a whole different story, of course. Yeah. Anyway, I'll shut up now. Thank you. That was an amazingly rich answer, Annika, and we could pull that apart and ask lots of questions um, based on what, you, what you've said. But I want to pass over to David Horn, who's also commented that his his um, connection hearing about Lutyens was through oh, yeah. Saxon and also Dartington. But over to David. Hi, I'm Annika. Thanks very much for that. Actually, towards the end of the answer to Jeff, you answered the question I was going to ask, kind of. But it still allows me to say congratulations on such a wonderful talk. Well, um, I, I really, really enjoyed it. And, and the combination of the musical analysis and you know, context was, was really, really engaging. Um, you, you kind of answered this a little bit, but I thought I might still explore it a bit further, which is I was really interested in, in looking at some of Lutchen's own um, kind of comments and who cares if it's retrograde or whatsoever. And I am reminded that we've got to be very, very guarded about what composers ever write or say. Um, and, and one can't help wonder that maybe she actually was quite interested in that. I, I was just wondering if, if this is, is worth kind of, uh, kind of critically reevaluating. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, she's, I mean, the people who, who do know of her usually know of her because of things like that that she said the kind of notoriety the the outrageous things the the swearing the kind of the the hanging around with the boys from the bbc feature department in you know in the pubs near near the bbc headquarters the nail varnish the trousers yes absolutely the, the, there is all of that and of course yes um composers be, beware of the musicologists because you know we, we, we may come along at some point and read all your emails and <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> this is this is definitely a danger. I I do wonder though. I think Latins, um probably would have. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if she would be happy about all of that that I've said here and about some of the things I've pulled apart. But I always got the feeling that she was someone who who was very happy for especially for notorious things that she said to actually be um, repeated and to be be common knowledge. Um, yeah. But I. Yeah. Hmm. No, I mean, I mean, obviously, I would have no knowledge at all about whether or not we should believe composers or not. I mean, I'm not really getting into that. I would have no expertise. Um, I, I do remember. I mean, I'm I studied with Saxton at Dartington in 1985, but back in the days when actually a 14 year old could go to a summer school and study with adults, um, um, with, with other adults. I mean, and and I mean, the way he talked about Lotchins was extraordinary. I still remember it, and he would talk in his lessons and his master classes about specific things that she had said to him. Yeah. Um, and I'm just thinking that kind of legacy um, of Saxon, of course, other people who studied with her is really quite remarkable. So thanks very much again. Yeah, yeah, thank you. 
I think the, the the idea that we shouldn't believe a word of what our composers write about is very pertinent at the moment because we have many people here who are writing either uh, commentaries for their PhD thesis and also 300 word statements if you're being entered into the ref. So we, we have to have a good sense of humour no, <laughs> to, to think about those things. But you're absolutely right. There's, and some composers we can believe more than others. And obviously the, the famous example is you can never believe a word of, that Stravinsky says about his own work. But I guess people believe um, vary a lot on that question. Yeah. If I may just, sorry, if I may just come in on that, I I, I would really, really not want to say that we shouldn't believe a word of what Latin said. Um, <laughs> as, you know, I mean, so 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 jokes aside, I think that she usually had very good reason for what she said or didn't say, and I think that a lot of the time this really has to do with the strategies and also with the ways that she was aware that she was perceived. Um, at at the time um she she struggled a lot especially from the time onwards when all of a sudden she she became you know from the enfant terrible when she turned into then a teacher and a mentor um, among other people of the of the uh, manchester people of course of Bert whistle and maxwell davis and goethe for a little while anyway um and and richard rodney bennett and and people like that that she was um uh, that, that she was listened to for, for the first time, but she she still, I think, had to be very, very particular about what she said and how she said it. And I think it's rather that she may not always have done herself a favor the way she said it, but when she said it, it, it makes absolute sense for me usually why she would say these things. So for example, with the whole kind of rejection of influence, it's 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 relatively clear, I think, why she why she took this stance, why she had to take this stance, being perceived as a, as a woman composer. And of course, these were the times when, in the sixties, um, I once read a sorry, I'm going out of out of my way here, but when you know when um, they interviewed some female composers in the sixties for kind of you know to say what's it like to be a female composer, and one of the people who were interviewed was the wife of a composer. So you know that's the that's the that's the world in which she was working. So she was very aware that kind of admitting influence through her husband from Schoenberg would do her no favors. It's just that, of course, today when you know we're trying to kind of lift Latin scholarship onto this level of, you know, onto a level that that we perceive other composers on, like like Schoenberg or Stravinsky, these kind of things crunch a little bit with. You know, with, and if you read it at face value, I have not been influenced by anyone. Then and you know and you don't go and look for things anyway you you might overlook this and that that has stopped her from i think having a a place in these in these traditions um but at the time it made sense for her to 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 say these things absolutely that's that fascinating response jane has got lots of things to say and certainly in the chat but i'm going to pass over to jane now not mostly not very interesting things. I wanted to say, Annika, congratulations, uh, 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 really to echo what David said, a, a really good and really engaging talk. So many, many thanks. Um, you know, we, we I, I didn't want to hijack this session. So I wrote to Annika a great length um, about my memories of Liz's year well it wasn't actually it was two terms at york in the autumn from 74 to 75 george actually has a, a, an even larger fund of stories about liz than i do um, but i did actually work with liz later on um when i was must have been the year after i left guildhall because i was understudy for jane manning in um, Infidelio, which was a, a kind of, wasn't really an opera, it was seven scenes for soprano and tenor. It was in a double bill with Nicola Lefanu, who of course was the next generation down and the daughter of Elizabeth McConkie. So, you know, these were the first women composers that I had come across. Actually, there were no women composers as I remember. On, well, there weren't any women staff in the music department at York um, at the time. And there and and such composers as there were were not in classical music. If you read about the Stepney sisters in The Guardian this week, you know, those those women are all composers, but they weren't, they weren't, and they were members of the music department, but they weren't, they weren't, they didn't see themselves as 
composers. Anyway, what I wanted to ask you about, you said in our correspondence that you were interested in her opera Isis and Desiris. Now, I don't remember if the performance, the production that I saw, which I think must have been in 76 or 77 at Morley College, I don't remember if that was the, I don't know if it was the premiere. And to be honest, I have fairly vague memories of it. Um, but you said this was something that you were really interested in. And I wondered if you'd like to say a little bit more about, um, about that. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, this interest in, in Isis and Osiris basically came from my, um, there is one, one small piece for soprano solo, which comes from Isis and Osiris, and that's the lament of Isis on the death of Osiris. And that piece shares, a beginning pretty much with the beginning of Au Saison au Chateau by Latins. Um, so again, you know, there's self-referencing going on here as well. Au Saison au Chateau is from, from a lot earlier, um, 47, I think, and we're premiered in 48. Um, so that's that's how I came across Isis and Osiris. And then it turned out that of all her stage works or operas, this was the one where the people who knew Latins and knew of, of, of her works were the most uh, critical or, or reluctant to to talk about, so that's that's what um, basically stoked my stoked my interest in it in the first place. Um, again, I when I was um, doing for for a week or so, I went to uh, the University of York Music Press archive, and they have a lot of tapes there um, of Latins, and I digitized Isis and Osiris. But as far as I'm aware, there really only was that Morley um, premiere. So is it, I think it's a classic case of first first equals last um, performance there. And someone said to me, I forgot who it was now, but that, that the opera actually, Isis and Osiris earned itself the nickname Crisis and Osiris. It's not very nice. Um, afterwards, because it hadn't gone very well. I mean, Latins often um, complained about rehearsal time, of course, um, for her pieces, like many composers, of course, did. And of course, her music was complex and required a lot of rehearsal time, which she usually didn't get. I mean, that goes for a lot of composers, of course, earlier, later. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's not quite clear to me whether, whether you know, how, how, how bad, if I may say this, how bad it actually was. Um, and uh, also kind of what, what caused this, um, this kind of, mm, this kind of case of, oh, it didn't go so well, or, or, or it flopped, or, oh, you know, um, let's not do that again. And whether it was a lack of rehearsal time, or whether it was the fact that it was, you know, that she wanted it performed somewhere else and, and got Morley, I, I don't know. That's why I'm interested in it. So anything. It, it, it doesn't surprise me just remembering, you know, it, it could be, music at Morley could be a bit chaotic. George, do you have any memories of Isis and Osiris? It was, thank you very much, Anna, you've given us a date, 26th of November, 76. That would be exactly right. I had just moved in with Jenny Miller, who I think was singing Isis. So I actually heard quite a lot of it at home, um, as you know, in our flat, as well as, as, as well as, at Morley in rehearsals. Do you have do you have any recollections of it, George? Uh, no, I missed out on that uh, for some reason. Although I do I do remember in Fidelio. Um, thinking about Liz and and rehearsals, I remember her saying that she wanted on her gravestone the legend. At least the BBC give you one rehearsal. Um, what I'm wondering about with the timing of the piece you're talking about, 1961, do you happen to know if Liz would have heard Stravinsky's movements? Because that came out in 1960. Yeah, good point. I don't know. Um, good point. I, I'll write that down. Go and look it up. Uh, if, I, hmm. I think it would be unusual if you hadn't caught up with it. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I'll do that. That's the sort of thing you need to make them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the one of the interesting things, and of course, one of the reasons why I wanted to present this here is by you know speaking of particular influences, um, it often opens a box, and often, of course, people know pieces that I may know of but have forgotten or that I don't know in the first place. So there is this is a collaborative enterprise, at least from from my so thank you. <laughs> I'll look that up. Um, yeah. The title is an interesting one because it does sort of recall both Kavinsky and yeah. um, Bartok. Um, yeah. But then, of course, Stravinsky's piano concerto is with wind. Yeah. As well. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
I think that that Liz Latians probably knew a lot more of Stravinsky's music than than she may have mm. had to uh, write down anywhere. Yeah. But but that I I don't know that. Um, it's just because I know that she she admired Stravinsky very very much. Um, you can you can tell that a little bit from these letters that she writes him. So um, uh, but sometimes I think he wrote to her in in French, and then she would reply half in French and half in English. And um, I think he he called her um, Cher Lys, and then but she would also always call him um, Cher Maître, uh, Cher uh, Monsieur Stravinsky. So she she never called him by his by his first name. So he was a kind of um, a really a, a figure of, of admiration um, for her. Although, of course, she, she had absolutely no qualms of claiming in the Goldfish Bowl that the first evening they met, they kind of, you know, drank the whole evening and kind of laughed at the same jokes and kind of just hit it off like this. But if you I look at the letters... And Thomas. <laughs> yeah, but if you look at the letters, you can see that she always addresses him even years later as uh, Cher, Monsieur Stravinsky. So, um, yeah, there is that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I, just um, looking at the chat, we've got um, discussions going on about the Year of the Ladybirds, but I, I pass quickly from that <laughs> to Larry, who's got a question for you. Hi, Annika. Thank you. I, echoing colleagues, I really enjoyed your talk um, loads. And I was just wondering about influence at the other end of the spectrum. I've, I was just reflecting as a non-Elizabeth Lutton's expert in any sense, how many anecdotes I've heard but how little I've heard about the influence of her music on that next generation. And I heard that it taught and was just thinking after your talk about the processional and um, cyclical and palindromic structures of Harrison Birtwistle and thinking about the timeline and the profile of that piece and starting to get suspicious. Was that influence, is that evident and I just haven't read about it or is it downplayed because of her gender or because of her own downplaying of influence? Do you have a perspective on on that on her yeah. influence and others very interesting question that's one of the things i'm looking at at the moment actually so i don't i'm not quite ready to, to give an answer to be honest uh especially as this is all very tricky isn't it you know as we're kind of and latians was once or twice in, involved in in quite quite strong discussions with um her former pupils or, or mentees about who copied from whom so that this is this is very thin ice i know that she fell out very terribly with i think it was richard rodney bennett um over something or he fell out with her i don't even know to be honest um so i wouldn't be surprised at all if you know there was something like this from latins to bert whistle kind of you know happening roughly um but i haven't looked at it enough yet but i actually have it here so i yeah it, it's something that i'm doing at this moment so thanks for reminding me of that <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, but very good point. I mean, I kind of, you know, in, in a slightly different sense, um, obviously, you know, the, these composers feature heavily when we look at Latin scholarship, but she doesn't feature in scholarship on, you know, on, on the Manchester School, of course, or only very, very marginally. Um, so kind of as a Philip Ruprecht wrote this book on, uh, it's called British Musical Modernism, and it's on the on the Manchester people. And um, Liz Latians is, is mentioned there, and I think it's a first pages of the of the introduction um this this concert that they gave in london um which had oh, how was it so it had it had, had their music and then also a piece by by Lutyens, um and one by ah uh, scheiber i think and people like that so kind of all their influences were there and latins was Lutyens was one of them but then of course it her, her trace basically fizzles out relatively quickly um, in the book um uh, yeah whether it's specifically because of her gender i don't know but um she's as an influence on on later generations, she, it's very very interesting, and it's something that I definitely still want to look at. I do know that um, in the eighties there was a um, an article came out, which basically someone in the US had sent out a survey to uh, women in music, women working music musicians, composers, uh, musicologists, to kind of ask about what the state of things was, how they felt they were working, whether they felt their gender was an issue, and several of them actually commented on Lutyens and the role that she had had as partly as a as, as a role model and partly very much not as a role model so I remember one of them saying specifically that um 
you know, Elizabeth Lutyens was always kind of the, the only female composer that I knew. And I knew also that I didn't want to be like her because it sounds like the life that and the career that she had was absolutely terrible. And it was a, it was a, it was a struggle all the time for her. Um, so, yes, um, influence of Lutyens, by Lutyens on, on later generations is, 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 again, very, very interesting. And I think it does exist. Um, but again, sometimes this is thin ice, sometimes there is little evidence. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely interested in that. Thanks, Larry. Great. Um, we've got uh, David Kane would like to ask you the next question. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Annika, for your talk. It was really rich. So many uh, buzzing ideas all over, all over the place. It was great. Um, I've just got a sort of um, statement of a vested interest, really, um, in, in two counts. Um, firstly, thinking of parallels um, with Benjamin Britten and the way in which the kind of eclecticism that surrounds Lutchens also surrounds Britain um, and the precarious position in relation to to modernism and it, it is curious that we sort of often think of Britain as a, a bit of an anathema in that respect whereas clearly he's he's not and other composers at the time shared that sort of eclecticism and my second kind of vested interest um, was uh, sparked by um, your comment on uh, Strauss's work of the revisionary uh, ratios um, and it struck me that in relation to Strauss's um, recent work on disability aesthetics in musical modernism, that there seem to be a lot of connections between some of the categories of um, disability aesthetics that he identifies in modernist music and some of those revisionary ratios. And I wondered if you'd sort of seen that connection yourself. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so I've, I've written this down so that I don't forget <laughs> the habit of answering question number one, then forgetting number two while I'm doing that. Um, Britain and eclecticism, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, oh, so yeah, as, as so often, there are of course um, several layers to this. I mean, Britain was, Lutyens is kind of nemesis a little bit. She, she, she resented his fame. Um, she resented the fact that he had his own entourage and his own festival. Um, at Albro uh, and all these things she was and this is this is also the beginning of, of a kind of a kind of um a row of comments really that she came out later in life really um you can notice I'm, how carefully I'm, I'm trying to phrase this um and her dislike of Britain she often um kind of you know tied this to um to you know what she called a homosexual clique of successful British composers. So in in old age, Lutyens um, had often kind of yeah made made comments like this on um, be it on you know Britain um, and Tippett um, as well kind of comes into this, but also on um, on Jewish composers. So there was there was definitely there were elements of anti-Semitism and and um, homophobia in, in at least her kind of her spoken um, kind of later, later life uh, um, narratives, um, which probably really came from her resenting the fact that she felt that she'd been basically overtaken by, by history um, to a degree that, you know, when she was writing serial music, nobody else was and nobody wanted to hear it. And then all of a sudden, everybody was writing serial music and, and hers was not, not cool enough anymore. Um, so there are these things, but of course that's, that's not really an excuse. And I know that a lot of her, several of her students um, struggled um, with, with these kind of opinions that she came out with a lot. So Lutyens wasn't a great fan of Britain, yes, but the eclecticism definitely is there. Um, it's, it's something that I think, I've got an article coming out of this sometime this year, who knows? the eclecticism of, of British music in the early 20th century is something that I think is 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 a much broader um, element. And I think that kind of, you know, climaxes in a way, if you want to, in Britain or also in, in someone like, perhaps more in Britain than, than someone like Lutyens, really. Um, but even if you look at things like Cyril Scott and, and earlier things or Rebecca Clark, you find them tipping from pentatonic scales into, into kind of, you know, uh, octatonicism within two bars. Um, you find them tipping from kind of you know a, a scriabin chord you know into um, into D minor into D minor you know from from bar to bar. So this eclecticism, I think, 
um, is there much earlier, definitely, than than Latins or Britain. But yes, it is it is perfectly possible that you know they sit within this tradition as well. Although, of course, Latins probably would have placed herself more kind of on the side of um, mid twentieth century ISCM crowd, uh, International Society of, of Contemporary Music crowd, than within this British tradition, which I guess wasn't really one to to kind of you know come out explicitly as well that much on Britain, although of course there would be much more to say. Uh, the second one, Strauss. Uh, I have to admit that I'm not terribly, I haven't caught up on Strauss's more recent work. Um, I am in the process of doing so, but I haven't fully done it. So I don't want to kind of speculate on the kind of similarity of, of these revisionary ratios to, to kind of his, his more recent work, except to say that that's really, really interesting. Because of course, the way it is phrased in remaking the past from 1990, you would not necessarily expect that this is transferable, really. Because um, we spoke quite a bit about this Bloomian theory um, in the in the research method seminar just now, and a lot of us were quite critical of it just because of this um, reliance on you know particular groups of composers. Kind of, you know, all the canons are there. You know, of early modernism again. You know, this is, this is five, the five usual composers are put through their paces. Um, you know, and are shown to be influenced by all the great composers of the 19th century, basically, you know, Stravinsky influenced by Chopin and um, Schoenberg influenced by Brahms, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, to to kind of be able to, to, to push revisionary ratios and this kind of idea of dealing with an anxiety of influence um, into this later work that Strauss is doing on disability um, is is something that's that's cool and definitely very much exploring. That's all I can say about that at the moment. Sorry. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Um, again, another very rich answer. Um, Anna Wright is is in in the 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 chat has talked that said that there are some there's some manuscripts in the Ina Mitchell collection. So uh, Anna, I don't know whether you want to say a bit more, but um, briefly, and then we've got the last question, which is from Harvey Davis. No, I just thought following on from. Um... Jeff's comment that she came to the college. I thought I would just look and see. Uh, Ina Mitchell was a um, a singer, and there's quite a lot of it, things. So I just put Lutchens into the search and for our archives catalogue, and uh, it's come up with a few pieces that, as far as I can see, are not listed on Grove. Although that's not always complete. But you might like to um, have a chat with Heather Annika and um, find out a bit more about those. Oh hell yes, you can be sure I will because I'm I'm still I'm trying to make a so the, the book should ideally have a, a catalogue of works as well with also with durations of the pieces and and obviously where they're published so that you know they they can perhaps in the future if anybody's interested be a little you know see a bit of a renaissance in performance as well but there are actually quite a few pieces which I know exist but I've, I haven't been able to find to find uh, scores or manuscripts at all um, so that is that is a nugget thank you it's <laughs> quite all right great so before we wrap up i think harvey would like to ask a question yeah thanks uh, barbara and thank you annika that was absolutely fascinating um uh, liz lutchin sits uh, um at exactly the same position um in, uh, certainly in, in terms of her lifespan um as the composer that i'm studying at the moment arnold cook and um, they knew each other um, reasonably well, I think. Um, I, I suppose I've got a, a couple of observations um, as much as questions, really. Um, one is that um, that is quite a funny story in a sense. It's like a slightly sad one as well. Um, there was some party or function at which it was after a, a performance, and I'd have to get more detail to um, say what it was precisely, but. Uh, uh, at which Lutchens and um, Cook were talking. And uh, <clears throat> they were overheard by the clarinetist Keith Puddy, who was in the London um, wind trio and uh, a very well-known clarinetist um, uh, in the 20th century. Um, and, uh, and apparently Cook asked her, uh, said, um, is this about this, uh, this idea of anxiety as well, about one's own style and one's own position in, in, <laughs> in music. Um, asked her if she liked his music, which, I mean, I, I think that's a very brave thing. I certainly wouldn't have asked her anything like that um, from what I know of her. And, uh, and her reply was simply, well, but if I liked your music, 
surely I'd write music like that. Which seems to me to betray actually not only not only um, an acknowledgement that therefore um, she's saying, well, I write music that's my music, but it must be because I like certain other music, perhaps you could read that in. Um, but as for dismissing Cook, I mean, it's quite interesting that you, what you were talking about, the sort of, uh, you know, the 19, 1939 festival in ISCM festival in Krakow, where, of course, she went to get away from all this, all this music and the, you know, the predominance of the second Viennese school um, music in, in, in those, the, the festivals of that period. But of course, ironically, one of the very pieces that was picked for the 39 festival was Cook's two piano sonata. Um, so she would have got over there and heard that at the same time, which slightly tickles me. Did she have any influence, here's my actual question, um, or contact with the Welsh composer Alan Hodinot, who is very well known for his palindromic compositional constructions and mirror writing? Yeah. I, think I, I think she did but I'm not sure. I right. think I, re I read about him somewhere sometime, but I can't, I can't recall the, I can't recall the exact circumstances now, but yeah, obviously I need to look at that. No doubt. I, I just to say that he, I mean, he's a generation later, of course. Yeah. Um, so born 1929. Yeah. 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 Exactly. But, um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, this, 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 um, that's why the, the idea of influence is so interesting, but also a very sensitive issue, isn't it? Because you, I mean, you know, again, we discussed this in the research method seminars. It's the kind of, you know, does it matter when two people have the same idea if one of them comes out with it one week before the other one does? To those two people, it certainly probably does. Um, you know, does it matter to, you know, the afterworld? Maybe, uh, you know, and kind of, we also were talking about, you know, influences as a one-way street, as a, you know, an arrow going from precursor work to successor work, as opposed to, of course, whole networks of ideas that may be in the air at the time anyway. I mean, you know, Schoenberg, that was also in the air. There were other people who were working with similar things. as me. And then it was Schoenberg who became famous for it. it yeah. So so these things are, are often very tricky, but I'm definitely, yeah, I definitely need to look at holding on because that. I, I mean, yes, it was a, it's possibly, um, um, mm -hmm. but you never know, do you? Uh, and the other person, um, Humphrey Searle, might be worth would have would have shared ideas uh, and would have you know um, sat together and, and talked together. Of course, I mean, Sol Sol was was a pupil of, of Webern, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, of course, you know, there is the direct line, the, the the first direct line, you know, as a kind of you know pupil of Webern's living and working in Britain. Whereas, of course, Lottians never had that direct line. You know, and if you know, did she want it? Probably not. You know. But um, indeed, uh, so yeah, so is is high up on my list of um, of um, people. Fascinating. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Annika, the, um, for a really, really fascinating talk. And it, it's, it's interesting that you, you've been talking quite a lot about the anxiety of influence, because in the late 90s, there was a real, a really, I guess, with Strauss's work, um, there was a lot of interest in musicology in, in all of that. And in fact, to a point where it became the thing to to write about in some ways, looking to bloom and, 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 um, and so to hear you returning to this, a generation later with fresh eyes and with a fresh perspective is really interesting because it's it's asking very pertinent questions that um perhaps we've not been asking because we were all sort of resisting at a certain point that whole sort of trend to look at the anxiety of influence so i think that's that's a really interesting thing and i look forward to to hearing that that discussion a little bit more but the, for somebody who felt the need to resist categorization and you can say i can under, understandably that there would be all sorts of reasons her gender all sorts of things of not being categorized in one group or another and and resisting um sort of aligning herself to a particular lineage that also then has um, perhaps an impact on reputations as well. So if if we're looking for who gets the credit for for the 12 note, um, you know, for serialism for 12 note is not going to be um, 
being British as well probably wouldn't ha- wouldn't help compared to being Austrian for, from that perspective. But there are all sorts of things that go into into that whole issue about reputations and how some people are credited with something and other people aren't. And that's the beauty of you coming back to this um, um, the, to study of Lutyens to, to see um, what's been missed out and what's been forgotten and where the the credit might where we might think about credit in a different a different sort of way or an understanding anyway so um there are even more comments going on in the in the in in the chat so if you want a quick look at them before we we finish off and and jane's got some really interesting things going on um Yes, about um, that idea of influence and wanting to cast off the parents, cast off the the, the musical influences, perhaps too. Um, psychologist talking, she's saying, and also her the, the the study that she's looking for her, her journal is also seems an intriguing one. And David Horn, um, the Met's offerings International Women's Day. Please, if I just say it, so they offered yeah. seven operas for free this week, and yeah. um, to celebrate International Women's Week. Now, on Met Opera on Demand, they only have one video of an opera by a female composer, and that's Sariajo's Amour de Loin, uh, L'Amour de Loin, rather. And it's not one of the offerings. And I think that says everything about the current problems that we still have. Fascinating. <laughs> so, thank you, everyone. Thank you for a great talk.